Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel and to another weekly recap. Week three, we're halfway through and uh, let's just get started. So we started off the week with a continuation of Johnny's cross-examination and the overall strategy that Rottenborn was um, utilizing was playing this succession of tapes you know, completely out of context, making Amber sound like a sweet little peacekeeper and Johnny the aggressor. And he just played them in succession, not really allowing Johnny to explain what was going on, which is understandable. Again, this is cross-examination. He's playing dirty. Many lawyers do it. And it's up to his lawyers, Johnny's lawyers in redirect to clean up the mess, which I believe they well and truly did. And they actually closed on a high note, not necessarily on a high note in terms of the evidence used, but I think they ended the redirect in a way that left the jury with a really strong moment and we'll get to it. But yeah, it was getting pretty nasty there, you know, just clip after clip after clip of strange things and Johnny yelling and Johnny being aggressive. And of course, you know, it, this is done on purpose. It's done by design. You will learn actually that Rottenborn, if you haven't picked this up already, he cherry picks. He cherry picks not just audio clips. He cherry picks witness statements to try to impeach or, you know, um, make witnesses seem unreliable or inconsistent. Rottenborn also pulled up a more post-divorce or post-breakup, um, very colorful, fantastical text messages that Johnny sent to third parties, where again, it is quite clear that he is exaggerating, but also conveying at the same time how much he just never wants to see or hear of her ever again. Rottenborn also continued to insist, after seeing the photos of Johnny's finger, that Johnny you know, cut his, the tip of his own finger off, which I believe I've said this in writing on social media. I'm not sure if I said it in a video or maybe I've put it in as a written caption in week two, actually, where it was his right middle finger and he's a right-handed man. And uh, again, we'll get to redirect where Johnny actually, again, casts more doubt to this um, version of the story. Rottenborn pulled up texts from 2014 where Johnny is thanking Paige for, you know, Amber and saying you've, you know, your water, your daughter was wonderful. She's helped helped me through my detox. She's amazing. And of course, Rottenborn's strategy here is to completely contradict Johnny and Debbie Lloyd and Dr. Kipper's evidence that Amber was in fact interfering with the deto detox process, which led to the medical staff, Dr. Kipper and Debbie Lloyd, to arrange to get Amber away from Johnny, and he uh, remained alone in his apartment for five to six days to complete his detox, and he needed to do this without her. So Rottenborn pulled up this text of Johnny saying she was incredible during the detox to discredit him, of course. Rottenborn then proceeded to go through a series of negative tabloid articles, and when I say negative, I mean not favorable to Johnny, that were published prior to the 27th of May of 2016, which is the day that Amber went to uh, court to get the restraining order and of course prior to the op-ed now these articles were mostly about Johnny's financial troubles substance abuse issues and his supposedly plummeting career which is crazy because you know again fantastic beast that's a movie that was released after their separation after their divorce and uh, Johnny came back for the second one in 2018 as well Ron Bourne also pointed out the fact that Johnny apparently didn't try to clear his name until the op-ed and I do believe every once in a while Johnny tries to interject he tries to explain himself because he you know it's very understandable because you don't necessarily when you're sitting there especially if you're not a lawyer you don't necessarily understand that your lawyer's job is to clean up this mess and give you a chance to explain things to the jury in redirect so he was trying to do just that. He was trying to give context, trying to explain himself. He spoke over Rottenborn. The overall atmosphere when Johnny was on the stand and Rottenborn was cross-examining him was quite hostile. And it's not just Johnny. You'll see that um, Amber's lawyers really take on the bad cop kind of role and they antagonize a lot of the witnesses, including one of the most impressive witnesses I've seen, um, Dr. Shannon Curry. But back to why Johnny didn't try to clear his name, he actually interjected and said, I did, I tried, but my lawyers told me not to. My lawyers basically told me not to say anything. And we'll expand on this further in 
the redirect phase. So in closing with this cross-examination, Rottenborn really tried incredibly hard, I would say, through you know, a string of successive objections. I'm talking Johnny's lawyers kept objecting to um, Rottenborn's questions towards the end. And he is really like a, I don't know, like, like a bull, you know, he just would not stop. He kept trying to rephrase the question in every way conceivable. And it kept getting objected to because essentially the core of the question was the same. But he essentially did this to try to show the jury that only the op-ed matters and that none of the context, all the background evidence matters. None of it matters. He's trying to tell them you're not meant to pay attention to anything leading up to the op-ed. It's just the op-ed, just that one sentence where she referenced him. But that's not how the law works. It's not how defamation law works. You know, you need contextual evidence. You need background evidence, especially when it's defamation by implication. Johnny Depp was not named. We're all agreeing to that. No one's arguing otherwise. And so in these situations, contextual evidence is all the more important when someone is not named, when it's all about what's being implied, innuendo. So now we get to the redirect phase. Like I said, there was a major cleanup process done by Johnny's lawyers and they were incredible at doing that. They really gave Johnny a chance to explain things and give context to these random clips and random text messages that Rottenborn cherry picked, which again is what lawyers do. So with regards to why he didn't do anything about the allegations until the op-ed, he did say that the op-ed was, and I'm summarizing here, he said a lot, but Johnny said, essentially, the op-ed was the final straw. You know, he didn't speak out before because he, he didn't want to bring even more attention to it by responding to it. And then he'll get another hit piece and he calls them hit pieces, you know, these articles written about him and about his rebuttal. And then it will just give, he didn't want to add more um, fuel to the fire in addition to his lawyers advising him not to. But um, yeah, it was the final straw. And he clarified, he confirmed that he was dropped from pirates two to three days after the op-ed was published. And he also stated that he had every intention to continue with the franchise prior to the role being essentially canned from, from the franchise. And he said, he explained how he had worked incredibly hard to create Captain Jack Sparrow. And it was quite a big deal for him to be told that it's over. He briefly talked about the impact of the op-ed and all the allegations in general on his career outside of Pirates. There was a movie he said um, he was on that went straight to pay-per-view because of the allegations. And this was just one example. Now the cleanup starts. So they went through the texts, all the texts that were pulled up. You know, they pulled up Paul Bettany texts. We all know what Johnny said about Amber in that regard. Um, texts to Vanessa Paradis, his ex-partner, where they weren't even talking about Amber Heard in that particular text. And again, if you don't know what text I'm talking about, please do watch the actual trial footage because it's too much information for me to go through in a recap. In one text to Paul Bettany, he mentioned how this was a direct reference to Monty Python. It was almost word for word. And so it wasn't just some horrible fantasy that Johnny had about Amber and you know what he could do to her, but rather cut paste from a show that he and Paul Bettany grew up watching and they both bonded over it. They have a very similar dark sense of humor and they really enjoyed that kind of humor. So it became a part of their sense of humor. Now this is an important part. It's the word monster because Rottenborn pulled up many texts where Johnny referred to himself as, or you know, a part of him as monster even outside of communicating with Amber. So just talking to third parties. So to Amber, it's a drug addled monster. But to Johnny, it was the man who was dumb enough. And this, these are his words, I don't think he's dumb. But he said, the man who was dumb enough to react to Amber. So he would try to flee. So he wouldn't continue to take part and then become the monster who yelled back, who reacted, who insulted back, because again, he's not denying, it's caught on tape. He also said that uh, he would use monster to um, describe his disappointment in himself to giving in to drink, giving in to alcohol, 
as a direct result of Amber's behavior, so as a direct result of her fights. I mean, he even said he would throw up after fighting with her as a direct result of that experience because it was so sickening to him. And he said, you know, I don't throw up from alcohol. His lawyers also really did an excellent job of bringing up text messages where his language is so obviously fantastical and not literal. For example, he tells Dr. Kipper, I have chopped off my left finger as a reminder. I should never cut my uh, right finger off ever again. And then clearly his left finger is very much there, very much intact. And I believe that was brilliant because it really demonstrated just how far-fetched his language can be and how it's never meant to be taken literally. They went through texts with um, Stephen Duders, his assistant, and how, you know, again, he wakes up, oh, you know, there's, there are dead animals, I'm a savage, I'm bleeding, and it's just dramatic, um, almost, you know, a novel that he would send just to get a reaction out of Stephen. It was never literal. In response to the allegation or the insinuation that he cut off his own finger, and I thought of this, and I'm so glad he brought it up because I'm a musician, my partner's a musician, you can all see the guitars behind us here. His first thought, or one of the first thoughts when this happened to him, the um, injury to his finger, was that, thank God it wasn't the fret hand, which is your left hand. Because otherwise, as he said, you would have to relearn how to play the guitar or bass or whatever such instrument um, from scratch. And so he says, why would I just start doing that? I don't have the propensity. Look at my history. I don't have the propensity to just cut off the tip of my finger. It's, it's not who I am. Why would I start suddenly doing that in my 50s? Which is the exact same argument that I use to argue you know, in his favor of why would he suddenly start being violent? in his 50s to his wife, when he's had a string of romantic partners his entire life. And these things have a pattern of behavior, these people rather. These things are not usually just a one-off. They don't start suddenly in, in, you know, in the middle of your life, literally when you're middle-aged. We can use Amber herself as an example. She started um, you know, having her run-ins with the law, I mean, young. Her first mugshot was in 2003 for driving with a suspended license. And then there was a Tasha. It's not Tasia. I've always said Tasia. I'm learning now that it's Tasha. The incident in the airport with her ex-partner was she was arrested. You know, there's that pattern of behavior. And they start young. He said things that were incredibly sensible as well. You know, like if I was just, because Amber alleged that he would just vomit every day in his sleep. And, and he, he told the jury, well, first of all, I would know. I would wake up the next day and I would know or even I would be woken up by the act of vomiting. But second of all, it's something you need medical attention for. You know, and this reminds me of one of the other fantastical texts, the very incriminating one actually, that he'd sent to Paul Bettany in uh, relation to the Boston 2014 flight where he goes, I'm a savage, I've had a thousand Red Bulls and how many vodkas and all that, haven't eaten for days. Again, he turned to the jury and very, um, politely explain to them how if I had actually done that, I would number one, probably be dead. And if not dead, I would have had to go to the hospital and get my stomach pumped. He just very briefly and succinctly makes sense out of nonsense. He was really good at that, in my opinion, because he wrote it, I suppose. So he's in, he's in the best position to explain to, to the jury what he meant and how ridiculous it would be to take these things literally. A few clips were played as well that were very clearly, you know, Johnny saying that he didn't want to be with Amber anymore. At one point, he takes off his ring in response to her telling him to do so, and she's just following him around. And, you know, he talked about gaslighting as well that he would hear in the clips, and this is him explaining to the jury. He would say, she would scream like a banshee, and then she would tell him to calm down in the actual audio clip, because that's what you would hear. You would say, you know, you would hear her screaming and maybe he yells back and responds and she tells him to calm down. There were even a couple of clips where Johnny was desperately trying to get away, even for just a couple of hours, he said, and she was crying, sobbing, begging him not to leave, that it causes her immense stress every time he leaves. And she even tells him she's going to die. 
if he leaves. And uh, to wrap things up, this is where things get really powerful. The clip that Johnny was left with at the end of week two, where he got emotional, where he was telling her to cut him. He explained it. He said, at that point, I had nothing. Uh, she had taken everything. And all I had to give her was my blood. It was his way of saying, just <laughs> have what's left of me, you know, have my blood. Because that's all I have to offer. You've taken everything and that's all you've left me with. So take that too. And of course we get to the finale of, of Johnny's testimony, which is the clip where she starts off crying, telling him, no, I can't backtrack on my allegations. This is 2016. So this is after the TRO. Um, yeah, she's crying and going, I can't, you know, all she cared about was her reputation and her credibility. You know, I can't, I can't go back on this. You know, what about my reputation? What about my credibility? And his attitude was basically, well, this is your mess. You know, who told you to lie? Who told you, who told you to go out and say those lies? It's up to you to clean it up in the media. You want to clear it up? And that's all she cared about. It was very similar to Jada Pinkett Smith, you know, going, we need to clarify the cheating scandal because of my reputation. You know, all they care about is themselves. And, uh... She said Johnny and his team forced her hand. And then she goes on to say, at least tell them it's a fair fight. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell the world that I, Johnny Depp, a man, am a victim too. See how many people will believe you. See how many people will side with you. And Johnny's response on the tape was, yes, I am. And his lawyers ask him to repeat that to the jury. What did you say, Mr. Depp, in response to Amber telling you that you're a victim, you know, as a male, a male victim of DV? And he said, I said, yes, I am. And they ended it there. And that's what I mean. It was such a strong note to end on. It was very profound. Next, we move on to Ben King, who was the house manager and also a personal assistant in general, but he was more of a house manager um, with Johnny. Now, in the context of Ben King, London and Australia came up in particular. And it is important because uh, Ben was really helpful with establishing that there is this pattern of behavior that even he witnessed because he kept saying same pattern. Now, the pattern of behavior was basically they'd start off being all lovey-dovey and then he would notice that as time progressed, the arguments would escalate as well. It was always Amber that he would hear instigating, provoking. At one point, he brought up a specific situation that he witnessed where Johnny just took his hand away while they were watching TV in London and a fight started as a result of that. He mentions many other instances, but um, he was very clear with, you know, the fact that it was Amber. She was the instigator and she was the one who just wouldn't um, want it to stop. And he also testified to the fact that Johnny would always remove himself, either go to the bathroom or play his guitar. He would always extract himself and then Amber would follow. And this is the pattern. It kept happening in Australia as well. Speaking of Australia, um, as I said, Ben was there and he actually was the one who found the tip of Johnny's finger. He documented all the damage in the property. Now, what's strange to me and strange to many people is that Johnny's lawyers or even the other side didn't ask for all the photos. This was made very clear in cross-examination that Ben didn't provide all the photos. He just provided some of the photos. He, he gave enough, but not all. And I just feel like they should have maybe, you know, in their subpoena gone, give us any and all photos in your possession. So I don't know what story is behind that. He testified as to the state of the house. He testified um, about where he found um, the tip. And it very much coincided with Johnny's version of the story. You know, Johnny was sitting at a bar stool in the bar and that's what had happened. And that's exactly where Ben found it. He found puddles of alcohol and specifically he found a smashed bottle of vodka. Again, everything is consistent with Johnny's version of the story. He saw Amber, of course, and he interacted with her, you know, uh, during the day in Australia. And actually he was the one who volunteered to escort her to LA to basically remove her from Australia. Now he says he was very close to her when interacting with her and he observed 
no injuries whatsoever, nothing unusual physically. On the plane, he says she asked him that question that is very telling. I believe we talked about this a lot two years ago in the UK case, where she asks him, you know, have you ever been so angry with someone that you just lost it with them? And he says, no. And um, in cross exam, they were very adamant with, you know, well, how do you know that this was about the incident? And he said, well, because it was in response to my asking her what happened. So he said, we both understood. It was, we were talking about the same thing because she said it in response to his question. Now, when they were disembarking after landing in LA, he did notice marks on her left forearm. He noticed them on the plane and he was sitting right next to her. He said they looked very uniform, long, thin, evenly spaced. And there are photographs of um, these injuries as well. These are the ones that on the tape, which is not played because of hearsay, Jerry Judge said on the tape in Australia that they, you know, he's seen these before on other people. They're self-inflicted. She is right-handed. It is on her left forearm. And uh, this is where I mentioned on social media very recently that this is uh, very much in line with that gone girl narrative of you want proof of a hoax? You want proof of the dossier that she was building? Have a look at these photos. I mean, who poses like that on purpose to flash these injuries? And also, th these photos were taken um, in April of 2015, which is a month after the incident, and they look fresh. They don't look uh, healed. They're very shallow, very thin, so they, uh, they wouldn't have been looking as fresh. So the fact that they look very fresh is quite confusing. And again, the way she's posing, who does that? You know, I've been around people who were uh, hurt by their partners and they do everything they can to hide them. In fact, Amber alleges she hid her bruises, right? In May 2016. So why are you proudly flashing the cuts on your forearm? It's just, there's no consistency. And you'll find that that's very common, very true, ironically, using the word, with of liars. There's just, they lack consistency. And I think another telling thing is um, she alleges she was essayed. And then she lands in LA and tells uh, and gives Ben restaurant recommendations. I mean, I don't know if you've been essayed uh, by your partner a day prior or you know a couple of days. I don't know if that's where your mindset will be. Just g giving him a tour of the penthouse as well, and yeah, telling him where what the good restaurants are. It's like okay, that's good to know that that's what's on the forefront of your mind when uh, you've suffered a three day hostage situation. It's also important to note because this is uh, Amber's lawyer's go to. Ben wasn't really on the payroll. Ben was never directly employed by Johnny, ever. He was always employed by the production company. So there's that argument of, you're loyal to Johnny, aren't you? You're on the payroll. It's, it's their first go-to, no matter wh what lawyer it is from Amber's side. That is the first thing they go to, to establish bias. So um, that didn't work here, because like I said, he's not paid by Johnny, in fact. Now, Tara Roberts is next. Um, she has been the property manager um, on Johnny's Island in the Bahamas for 15 years. But she's also made it clear that apart from the income, the salary that she received, received from Johnny, she also has um, dividends and family rental properties, family businesses. So he's not her sole source of income. She gave a stellar review of his personality and also testified that when Paul Bettany and his family visited in 2013, she was the one who was tasked with booking a flight for Amber to get her off the island. Again, consistent with Johnny's version of what happened when she made Paul Bettany's child cry. Tara was present during Johnny's detox in 2014, um, and she testified that she observed no injuries on Amber. She was there during the December 2015 Christmas um, period, and testified that Amber doesn't often wear any makeup on the island, or at least she doesn't recall seeing Amber wear any makeup. This is when she had her photo shoot, there are photos, and no injuries were noticed. Now we talked about it last week, I believe, where I um, shouted out Andy from the UK, and you just, if your nose was broken, you don't look like this. Tara also talked about the incident where she witnessed Amber and Johnny um, actually arguing, it was so bad that she and another employee by the name of CJ had to follow them because Johnny had come over to the office and then Amber followed him there. A fight started, she started begging him to come home. They went back home, another fight started and Tara and CJ were there because they were worried. And then Tara actually you know, saw Johnny emerge with um, an, a bruise, an injury on his nose and she applied an ice pack to it in the cafe. She took him to the cafe and he spent the night there and she 
told CJ to spend the night there to basically make sure Johnny's okay. And uh, yeah, she witnessed all of that. She didn't see any injury on, um, on Amber. And during the cleanup, after the couple left, she um, noticed that there was liquid from a can of mineral spirits that had leaked. Art supplies strewn everywhere. Again, completely consistent with Johnny's testimony. The relevance of the mineral spirits can, by the way, being that that's what Johnny alleges Amber threw at his face. Tara also testified that Johnny was never really a passed out drunk kind of person. In cross-exam, that was, uh, they tried to obliterate that by saying that, oh, wasn't he passed out on his face in the sand one time in the Bahamas near his children, around his children, and they were distressed. And in redirect, Tara uh, was uh, given a chance to clear that up and said, no, actually he was asleep on a hammock, which flipped over and he fell, but he kept sleeping. And so she dusted him off. She kind of cleaned him up, but left him sleeping. But in cross-exam, they made it look like he was just flat on his face, passed out drunk. The cross-examination strategy, just in general, there's no point in going into a lot of detail because it's the same, was that you don't know she was not wearing makeup. You don't know for a fact. And also you weren't there the whole time. They tried to say that when you took a video of Johnny's property on the island, you deliberately didn't film the bathroom and, and what is it? The cabinet, the closet next to it. When you look at the video on Twitter, you can actually see the bathroom. So I don't know what, I don't know what they were getting at. You can see the bathroom. They're trying to insinuate that that's where the fight took place and there was damage in there and she's trying to cover for Johnny. But Tara's like, I, I, I just filmed everything. So I don't know what you're talking about. They're trying to cast doubt in the jury's mind that no matter what these witnesses say, only Amber and Johnny know what happened. And these witnesses don't know what happened behind closed doors. Yeah, they may not be direct witnesses. In some instances, some of them are. But circumstantial evidence is not weaker evidence. That's a misconception that certain people have. I'm surprised that a lawyer would have that misconception. But they're probably just trying to sway the jury. Direct evidence is basically you've directly witnessed it. Circumstantial is evidence that you, know, you use to kind of put the puzzle together, you put the pieces together, but it's just as strong, if not stronger. For example, fingerprints or DNA evidence is circumstantial evidence. My final point with regards to this is makeup does not cover a broken nose. My favorite witness so far, other than um, Isaac, Dr. Shannon Curry. They really tried to destroy her. So Dr. Uh, Curry was retained by Johnny and she examined Amber twice in December of 2021. So this is relatively recent. She went through extensive testing. She talked about it in great detail. Again, highly recommend you watch at least this testimony in addition to Johnny's. And she talked about how, well, first of all, she talked about the symptoms of BPD and histrionic and then connected them to Amber's behavior. She talked about the extensive testing for PTSD that Amber alleged she had, and it turned out that Amber tried incredibly hard in a very sophisticated manner. So Amber is actually a clever borderline. Amber is a very sophisticated version, um, very um, socially, what's the word? She, she used an actual word, but they're very street smart, basically. And she talked about how she tried really hard to dupe the system into thinking that she had PTSD and also into, you know, she tried to answer questions in a way that made her out to be completely blameless and there's nothing wrong with her. But the system is so sophisticated that it actually tells the uh, practitioner, the psychologist conducting the test, that the patient is actively trying to deceive them. And that's exactly the result that uh, Dr. Curry got. In fact, Amber was in the 98th percentile of exaggerating. So it was an extreme form of feigning, as uh, Dr. Curry liked to call it, also known as malingering. Very common phrase we use in the military as well. Faking an injury to get out of duties, basically. With regards to PTSD, I just think it's very important to point this out. Um, Amber said it's, that she had 19 out of the 20 symptoms, which uh, Dr. Curry said is not typical of even people with the most severe form of PTSD. I'm assuming Amber tried to do her research to dupe the system beforehand, and maybe she's not that clever. I don't know. I feel like from my experience, clever people don't get up to the shit that she gets up to. On a serious note, though, if she, you know, if she truly has these uh, personality disorders, which, which I have no reason to doubt now after such ex extensive testing, it, you know, it's... 
one can feel bad for someone like that. And I, I do hope that she gets help. But the thing with these people, and like I said, I'm speaking from really personal experience here. They refuse to get treatment because they are not convinced that there's something wrong with them. You know, narcissists, borderlines, histrionics, they, and this is generalizing. There are many borderlines who do recognize that they have a problem and they actively go seek therapy to help manage it because it's a lifelong condition. Dr. Curry explains that there's no cure. You can only manage it, but many of them, and she testifies to this, refuse to acknowledge that they have a problem. And this includes Amber. Amber actually was described as being in denial of anything negative. It's all everyone else's fault. There is absolutely no sense of, you know, responsibility. There's no insight. Now, the cross-examination was weak, in my opinion. They tried to make doc Dr. Curry out to be a biased individual because her interview consisted of dinner and drinks with, with Johnny's lawyers um, at Johnny's house. I mean, I do wish that drinks and dinner were not served, and I do wish it was just an interview. But, you, you know, she used actual tests that, that she talked about in great detail. She named them, they're verified tests, they're, they're heavily researched, they're highly sophisticated. Amber used an iPad to um, answer 567 questions or something. So it wasn't up to Dr. Curry to just look at her and assess her and make a biased diagnosis. That's absolutely not what happened. She just administered the tests and then interpreted the results as any professional in her position would. And so the argument of bias, in my opinion, is very weak. Of course, then there's the muffin story, muffin gate, <laughs> where Amber um, showed up to one of the appointments with Dr. Curry and Dr. Curry explained that she actually has the tendency or, you know, the nice kind of habit. I don't know if it's called a habit, but you know, this thing where she brings in muffins to work because they have a bakery close to where they live and they, they have amazing muffins in that bakery. So one day she brought in these muffins and offered one to Amber and they enjoyed, uh, they enjoyed muffins together. And then of course, Amber, true to form, again, copy paste. These people are so similar. Goes to her lawyer and goes, hey, so she told her husband about me and she breached confidentiality. Her husband knew that I was the patient and he made muffins for me. He baked muffins for me. And then that was the story they tried to uh, push, but it, I think they just shot themselves in the foot because they just showed how devious and manipulative Amber is in, in, the, in, the, in the course of things because Dr. Curry's explanation was just plain and simple. She was running late as she usually does. And she asked her husband if he could run out and get the muffins. Her husband knows she has high profile clients, didn't know it was Amber Heard, didn't know it was Johnny Depp. He just got her the muffins like he normally does and she offered it to Amber. It just goes to show that people like Amber, you know, again, I don't want to paint all borderlines with the same brush because I know there are good people out there trying to get better, but people like Amber, you just don't extend any kind of kindness to them. I mean, look what she did to Johnny. They will stab you in the back any chance they get, even if you've done nothing to them. Elaine's also allergic to the name Tasha because <laughs> Dr. Curry kept trying to reference Amber's pattern of behavior, gee, I, she was an incredible witness. She also explained to the jury in an indirect way um, that it's very inappropriate for Amber's therapists, in, including Dr. Cowan, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Banks, to um, form opinions or to state in their reports that Johnny definitely committed DV. She said, that's not our job. Our job as therapists is not fact finding. We're not investigators. We're not detectives. Our job is to be an advocate for our client, to support them. And yes, that may extend to believing them. But that's why she said it's very inappropriate for a therapist to give their opinion during a trial or for you know, judicial purposes. They should only stick to the facts because they are biased, whether they like it or not. You know, they have formed this relationship with their patient. They have shared moments together. You know, it's an intimate environment therapy. And by virtue of their job, as I said, they are their client's advocate. So their opinion is going to be biased, whether they like it or not. And so it's inappropriate to even introduce it. And I love that she said that because obviously, you know, I believe I saw Dr. Cowan's name on Amber's witness list. So he's going to come there. I don't know if it's, you know, in person or um, recorded. And he's uh, probably going to make a lot of inappropriate 
comments that support Amber's story. And now the jury has that warning in their head. You know, Dr. Curry planted that seed of don't take what they say as fact just because they're an expert. They're not an expert on what happened between Amber and Johnny because they weren't there. All right, next are the officers. I'm going to try to lump in Melissa and Tyler together because they were together and it's in the interest of time. But essentially, um, Officer Signs was a training officer who specialized in DV and Tyler Haddon was her trainee at the time. So they recount the events of the 21st of May when they were called um, indirectly by IO in New York. And again, I'm gonna breeze over this. So I'm just gonna focus on the important bits. They were so adamant, the two of them, and they were deposed separately, that Amber was not injured to, to the point where they showed her photos of Amber's supposed injuries from that night. And they said, I don't see any injury. And they were very straight faced, very detached. You know, they're just police officers. They didn't even know who she was. They had no idea she was um, Johnny's wife. They had no idea that Johnny was even involved in this. And so when they were showed the photos in front of the jury, in their depositions, they just both were, I don't see any injuries. And then they showed another photo. No, I don't see it. What do you see then? I just see redness um, in a white female who's crying. And that's what I saw in person as well. And they kept, they just stood firm. I don't see any injuries, no matter what photo was put to them. And of course, the photos that were shown were from the night. It wasn't the aftermath. It wasn't the bruises. It was just the redness. They did try to argue and cross-exam that, hey, you know, I think it was Elaine. She was like, at the end, she said, uh, you do realize that if you didn't do your job properly, you can be um, subject to punishment, discipline, disciplinary action, you know, for being negligent or for bringing the LAPD into disrepute. And Tyler, I think it was Tyler who was asked that question. Tyler said, yeah, I know. So they were trying to insinuate, you just didn't do your job right. And now you're just kind of covering for yourselves by insisting that she's not injured, that she was not injured and that there was no damage. I mean, the damage, look, there was a body cam footage from the officers. Um, so it was Officer William Gatlin, who was uh, deposed. His partner was not deposed. But we saw the footage again and there was no damage. There was that slight stain in, in the hallway, which aligns with what Isaac testified to, so that's not shocking. But let's uh, remember that I believe Isaac came home after Tyler and Melissa, after the two officers left, if I've got the time right in my head. They were asked numerous times why they didn't file a DV report. And they said, well, because it's not in our policy to file if there is no evidence of a crime. We saw no evidence of a crime, no injuries. Um, all of the witnesses, all of them, even the third party, you know, Josh and uh, Raquel, were uncooperative. And you can see this in the body cam footage where there was a third female as well. I don't know who, who was talking on the footage, but basically they're like, everything's fine. You can leave now. And they were reluctant to even let them in, talk to them, give them any information. And yeah, it's the same story as the UK. No property damage, no injuries, no nothing. Just Amber crying. Next, Alejandro Romero, the um, front desk concierge at the ECB, testified. Uh, this one was quite entertaining. He was quite a lovable, kind of big lovable guy. He was very honest, very kind of, man, he really wore his heart on his sleeves because he complained twice about how he just didn't want to do this anymore. He's like, man, everyone's got issues. You know, I just want this to be over. But he was very helpful and so disarming. He had a very Isaac kind of honest touch to him. He was so honest and again, unbiased, didn't have a preference, didn't really necessarily, you know, he wasn't pro Johnny, pro Amber, very neutral. But he talked about how he saw her multiple times in the week leading up to the 27th of May in really good lighting. And while he couldn't say if she had makeup on or not, he did say she looked pale. He said that. But he also agreed that, well, he wouldn't know if she had any makeup on or not. But he did say, if there was swelling, I would have seen that because I look people in the eye and I would have noticed, you know, this is something that would stand out to me. But more importantly, he also said, makeup can cover bruises, but they can't cover the swelling. And he just said it in such a flippant, like, 
matter of fact way that really made me laugh because I was like, you tell them, Alejandro, you tell them that makeup can only go so far. I don't know what kind of magical makeup Elaine and Amber, I mean, we know it's not the Milani palette because Milani themselves came out and said it's not, didn't exist until December, 2017. But you know, I, I want to get my hands on that makeup where you can just conceal a broken nose, um, two swell, swollen black, you know, lumps for eyes and um, just intense bruising and swelling. It's just magical. And by the way, he didn't just talk to her um, at the front desk every now and then. He accompanied them one time to the penthouse because <laughs> Raquel left her little dog out or it escaped and it was scratching at the door trying to get back in and they thought someone was trying to break in. And he was like holding his head recounting the, this incident because he just couldn't believe, he didn't say it, but it was all but said, you know, he couldn't believe their stupidity. He's like, it, the, the scratches are four inches above the door, lady. It, it's not a human being. But he came up to, s to conduct a sweep of the house to see if there was anyone in there um, because it's his job. But yeah, he, was, he said, I stood right next to her the whole time in the elevator, in her apartment, all in good lighting. Next is Christian Carino. Now, he was Amber and Johnny's talent agent, but he no longer works for either of them. And he also formed a very close relationship to the two of them. He actually knew Amber first. But essentially, they both would confide in him during their um, relationship and marriage. And Christian made it quite clear that Amber's allegations, in his opinion, had a, a negative impact on Johnny's career. And he also talked about how after the op-ed, he basically had um, meetings with studio execs about Johnny and how Disney was essentially dropping him. And to make things clear, Johnny's talent agent, who no longer works for him, no longer on the payroll, <laughs> not that he's on Johnny's payroll, and he was employed by C, what is it, CAA, I think, but he doesn't have a bias. Um, he said that Johnny's loss of his role as Captain Jack Sparrow was related, directly related to Amber's allegations. He said it was implied, even though the Disney execs never really verbally said it, you know, verbatim or even wrote it. He said, I understood, the executives understood, we all understood. He also talked about how staff at CAA, including Christian himself, all tried to get Johnny Rolls in Disney outside of Pirates to no avail. We get to the good part with Christian. Oh boy. So get this, and I've never heard this before. On July 2016, Amber reached out to Christian and told him, hey, I've been going to therapy with um, this psychologist or therapist that um, Christian introduced Amber to, I believe. Her name was Lauren, I think. Laurel, Laurel Anderson. Um, he introduced them both uh, because they needed help. That's what he said. And so she texts him in July, 2016, 14th of July, 2016, and goes, I saw her and she says, I have to talk to Johnny directly. She talks about how much she missed him and whether she can, uh, whether, you know, Christian can arrange for a meeting. And she would tell him things like, please tell him I love him. And this is July, 2016, after she got the TRO and the TRO was active. And uh, Christian said that Johnny was reluctant to this meeting to begin with, but then he agreed and he was with them. He was with them when they initially met in San Francisco and then they had to go to the, ho to the hotel room and he was with them the whole time. And he said they just argued the whole time. And he also confirmed um, Amber's relationship with Elon Musk, not necessarily during the marriage, but he said it was pretty much immediately after her, she divorced, or not divorced, but after her separation with Johnny. But he said during that whole time, she was still in love with Johnny and she kept texting him about Johnny. I miss him, I love him. And this was all confirmed by Johnny's lawyers. And this was about who, who was she talking about in this text message? And he would say, Johnny Depp. So it wasn't about Elon Musk. There was one text message about her being sad about breaking up with Elon. Um, but then immediately proceeds like, you know, a few days later to go, Oh, I miss Johnny. I've written him so many notes. Can you please give him one? And I was in shock. I was in shock. 2017, August, this woman is still chasing Johnny, hoping for reconciliation after what she put him through. And then in, uh, on his birthday, Johnny's birthday, 9th of June, 2018, she sends him a text message to wish him a happy birthday. And she told Christian this, you know, I sent him a message, but he didn't respond. So the jury heard evidence that at least up until June, 2018, and this is from what we know because of Christian, God knows who else she tried to use to get to Johnny. Cause you know, we only have Christian's account. She could have used multiple others to try to get back with Johnny. And we just don't know about it. 
But it looks like the op-ed was, uh, I mean, even though she didn't come up with it, we, we hear from the ACLU that it was suggested, it was brought to her attention, like, hey, do you want to write this op-ed? But I do wonder whether she saw it as a chance to get back at him for rejecting her and for ignoring her and for just not wanting anything to do with her. Next, we hear from Laura Wasser, who is Wasser, Wasser, I don't know who was Johnny's divorce lawyer at the time. Um, now, her relevance really comes into Amber's financial demands before getting the TRO. We saw the letter sent from Amber's then uh, divorce attorney, Samantha Spector, with the financial demands, which were extensive and completely unreasonable. It, it read like an extortion tactic. Um, and then she said that despite the fact that we had engaged in dialogue as in Laura engaged in dialogue with Samantha Spector. They got the TRO at 8.30 in the morning on the 27th of May without notice. And as I said, it was ex parte. So without the other side even being present. So it was a dirty, dirty move, basically, because it's not like Johnny's lawyer, Laura, was ignoring them and they had no choice but to go get the TRO. It was... You won't give us our demands, huh? You won't bow down to us? Okay, we'll show you. And that's what they ended up doing. All right, now we get to Terrence. I'm, I suck at saying this last name. Doherty. Doherty? <laughs> Who was um, a lawyer and a chief, the chief operating officer at the ACLU. The relevance of um, this testimony, it was an extensive deposition. It was very long, so I'm really going to have to summarize this one. But it really set, centered on the donations, right? The three and a half million dollars that she had offered to um, donate to the ACLU. Now, I learned that Elon Musk was actually the one who came up with the idea. He emailed the CEO, I believe, of um, the ACLU, Anthony Romero. He had a pre-existing friendship there. And so he discussed that option. Now, Terrence was very clear with saying that Amber didn't, sign the pledge form that they sent to her as a thank you, I believe, for the first donation, which was $350,000. So that was the only direct donation from Amber. There was a $500,000 donation from a donor advised fund um, called Vanguard Charitable, and that was connected or is connected to Elon Musk. And we know she was in a relationship with him at the time. And then there was another $350,000 donation from a fund called uh, Fidelity Charitable. They don't necessarily know who's connected to that. Amber told them it was her, but Terrence said that that's the only information we have. You know, we didn't confirm, we couldn't confirm um, whether it is actually her um, donor advised fund or not. But to be clear, Amber has not donated the three and a half million dollar um, pledge or sum that she publicly stated she has already donated in full there was one interview that I'm sure all of you know. It was um, a European talk show. I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact uh, country. But she essentially says, I wanted nothing. And uh, that was in response to them asking her whether she donated the seven million. And she basically says, yeah, I did, and I wanted nothing. There was a divorce settlement. You got seven million dollars. People were saying, this is all about the money. But then you did something that uh, twisted that whole argument. What did you do with that money? Seven million dollars in total was donated to, I split it between the ACLU and Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Okay. So well, more power to you because that's, that's something that I've never I heard I wanted of, uh... nothing. So we now know she's a liar, but I mean, I mean, if you didn't know, you were probably you know, sleeping under a rock. But all in all, I gather that she's still an ambassador for the ACLU, and get this joke, right? She's an ambassador for women's rights, specifically gender-based violence. And it doesn't get more ironic than that. I just, I mean, I made this kind of uh, quip online going, yeah, she is an expert on gender-based violence. She's had a go at Tasha and she's had a go, to, a go at Johnny. So both genders. They don't expect their donors to pay the full amount in one go. So, the, so there was apparently a 10-year plan that they had discussed and then put into the pledge form, but she never signed it. And to Terrence, he said, that's when I knew that, I don't know, maybe we're not going to see all of, you know, the three and a half million from her. So far, I think they have 1.3 million. And we do know that it was only 350,000 directly from her. There was also the 100,000 directly from Johnny on behalf of Amber. So that's included. 
Then, of course, they talked extensively about the op-ed because, as I said, uh, someone from the ACLU came up with the idea and there was talk about how there was a lot of back and forth because Amber really wanted to name Johnny or at least say my husband. She really wanted to identify him and there was a lot of support for that because they wanted it to be a powerful, impactful piece. Apparently, you know, naming someone without checking the facts is a powerful, impactful piece. I mean, it was powerful and impactful. It destroyed Johnny's career, so you didn't have to name him. He's, he's that famous. But yeah, they talked about how Amber's lawyers really watered it down. But the jury did hear in the deposition, obviously, that it was about Johnny without a doubt. And Christian Carino actually also made it clear that everyone, everyone knew it was about Johnny. In fact, in Taryn's deposition, someone called Jessica Weitz, I believe, from the ACLU who was liaising with Amber a lot and I think put her forth as an ambassador, when the op-ed was out, she was kind of complaining about how it was rewritten in other publications such as US Today where they specifically um, named Johnny. And so Jessica was like, well, they get to do it. You know, they're basically writing, you know, writing our wave and ripping off our article and naming Johnny, thereby generating more kind of um, interest. But the point I'm trying to make here is even Terrence said that other reporters and people immediately connected the dots, immediately, and named Johnny Depp based off Amber's op-ed. Now, with Amber's team, they kind of tried to d demonstrate to the jury that, you know, Amber never really, firstly, never intended on paying the whole thing in one hit. As I said, she's already said she did, so it goes to her credibility. But also, um, they brought up how it was Johnny's fault she couldn't continue making the payments because since 2018, that was her final payment, she hasn't made one. And she said that it's because of the fact that Johnny filed a lawsuit on the 1st of March, 2019. And so she was in financial strife. So once again, going back to Dr. Um, Curry's diagnosis and one of the one of the traits that Amber has is refusing to accept responsibility. And it's, you know, blame is always extraneous. It's always someone else's fault. It's Johnny's fault that I couldn't continue paying or donating the money. Also, uh, since Amber never signed the pledge form, and also I believe she never used the word pledge, she used the word donate, it's not a hard and fast rule. The law is always gray with interpreting things. But Terrence did say that using the word donation rather than pledge makes him lean more towards the fact that it was never a legally binding promise. Whereas using the word pledge generally means it's a legally binding promise, um, and there's usually consideration given, for example, naming a hall or a building after you. In that instance, the donor would be liable. They'd be held to, um, I guess, specific performance. You know, you, you need to fulfill your end of the bargain. Next, we move on to Johnny's accountant, the person in charge of Johnny's business affairs, Edward White. The relevance of his testimony was really <laughs> Amber's demands. How when they were discussing, you know, the settlement for the divorce, she started off with $4 million and it just kept going up and up and up until eventually Johnny had to pay $14,250,000 in consideration, free of taxation. So we all hear about the $7 million settlement, but that didn't include all the liabilities and everything that he had to pay as per Amber's demands. And um, initially the settlement was meant to be paid directly to the Children's Hospital in LA and the ACLU, but Amber insisted that it would go to her account. In cross-exam, by the way, um, things got tense. Edward did not like Rottenborn, but I mean, honestly, he's not, <laughs> Rottenborn's not helping his case. His job's not to be likable, fair enough. But uh, the, I said this in the podcast, there isn't just one way to do your job as a lawyer. There's, you don't have to be nasty. He's choosing to. He went straight to the payroll and said, oh, you've been paid millions by Johnny over the years, as if he was just giving it off for free, as if Edward was not working incredibly hard to fix the financial mess that Johnny found himself in, in 2016, because guess who Johnny was having a meeting with on Amber's, on the eve of Amber's 30th birthday, 21st of April, Edward White. He was tasked with fixing the mess that Johnny found himself in um, for trusting the wrong people and managing his affairs. So yeah, uh, Rottenborn, people get paid to do their job. I mean, you're standing there paid by Amber. You're, Amber's paying you to do your job. It's kind of how the world works. So I suppose we shouldn't buy anything that comes out of your mouth because you're biased. You're on the payroll. You know, you're, you're Amber's lawyer. 
Second last, Malcolm Connolly, um, one of uh, Johnny's security detail, and I believe he still works for Johnny, started working for him directly in 2006. He was there in a number of important incidents. Hicksville, not much that he witnessed in Hicksville, just that they were arguing, but he went to his caravan for that night and didn't really see anything else. Australia, he was there in Australia, but before I get to that, he was present on their honeymoon trip in 2015 when they got on the Asian train tour thing. And he sh they show the photo that he took where Johnny looks like he just got out of a boxing ring and I'm not even trying to be funny, you know. Johnny was beaten up, Amber wasn't. And Malcolm testified to that, no injuries. And he actually testified about Johnny's uh, injuries in general, how throughout the years they just progressed and it became more regular. And he noticed that it was always on the left side of his face and his neck, scratches, bruises, bumps. When you're injured on the left side of your face, it's usually because the person attacking you, usually, when you think about it, is right-handed. And I believe Amber is right-handed, so. He talked about a couple of instances where he saw Amber throwing things at Johnny. So again, that pattern of behavior, you know, if she threw a lighter, and a soft drink at him, why wouldn't she throw a can of mineral spirits? And then Australia, he was there. He was, he was very important, an integral witness to describing Amber's behavior at that time. He said it was chaos. She was screaming. Uh, he described her as crazy, crazy, crazy. Three times in a row, fierce. She was fierce and not in a good way. He talked about the injury and how horrendous it was and his role in escorting Johnny out of the house and taking him to his own apartment and um, getting him to the hospital. In cross-exam, of course, they jumped straight onto the payroll. There was a funny moment where he, <laughs> they said, Johnny gives you gifts, you know, doesn't he? And, you know, amounting, you know, what, 8,500? And then Malcolm was like, 8,500? He's giving me more than that. And it was a really funny moment. Johnny was laughing really hard. It was adorable. There was another moment when Johnny laughed really hard, actually, when um, the lawyer, I don't know his name, but I think he has the same surname as Elaine Bredehoft, I think. But he asked him about whether Johnny was urinating in Australia. And he said, you know, did he have his penis in his hand? And then Malcolm said, I think I'd remember if he had a penis in his hands. But yeah, there was a big laugh there too. More important information around Australia is he never saw any injuries on Amber and he was within three to four feet away from her. He said this in examination in chief and then also in the redirect phase. So consistency, same answer for 15 to 20 seconds on their way out. And he said the lighting couldn't be better. Finally, Starling Jenkins. Now, he was mostly relevant for the Coachella and uh, Poopgate incident. Uh, he confirmed that on their way to Coachella, he had a discussion. Or was it on the way? Basically, after the 21st, so on the 22nd of April, 2016, he had a dis discussion with Amber. And this is how she described the turd incident. She said it was a horrible practical joke gone wrong. He talked about how she threw Johnny's personal possessions um, out of the balcony that night. Now, apparently Johnny had done it first and Amber had to re you know, retrieve her phone. Johnny's phone ended up in Skid Row with, um, as Rottenborn put it, an unhoused person, I think. But yeah, they talked about that. And in cross-exam, loyalty was used against uh, Starling Jenkins as usual. Payroll was used against as usual. Um, Johnny's uh, safety above all others. You know, the, 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 usual, the usual kind of, discrediting, you know, trying to plant the seed in the jury that these people are not reliable, you know, he's their boss. It worked in the UK, at least on Justice Nickel, or Injustice Nickel, as people like to call him. Amber's sickness came up again in Coachella, the fact that she had drugs and alcohol on an empty stomach and was not well, and they tried to say, you confused her for Whitney because Whitney was pregnant, and he was like, well, I took, she was with me in the car. I took her to 7-Eleven to get her meds, and then I put her back in her suite. So I think, you know, I would know if it was Whitney Hurd sitting next to me or not. And that's where I'm going to end it. Uh, I hope you all found this informative. Again, I tried to impart as much information as possible. There's not much room for my own opinions and commentary, so I leave that for the podcast. Hope to see you there. If not, we'll see you in the week for a recap. Thank you, everyone, for all your support. And uh, until next time.